Good morning, everyone. Hello from beautiful Denver, Colorado. Uh, I'm here for the uh, supercomputing conference all this week. And so this recording will serve as the lecture for Monday, November 13th and Wednesday, November 15th. Quick reminder that your type checker is due on Monday at 5 p.m. And then I'll be back in class uh, as usual on Friday, and I'll try to handle any questions that came up from uh, watching this video and reading chapter 11. Now, uh, I just want to say that uh, we've come quite a long way from our uh, beginnings in uh, scanning individual characters and then uh, going through uh, parsing and understanding uh, grammar classes and then uh, finally using bison to pull things together and then uh, type checking to evaluate the semantics and now that we've gotten to code generation I think what you find as long as we get organized uh, it's really not all that challenging to emit working assembly code at least something rather basic and you'll find once we get the basic idea going uh, you'll be ready for uh, then uh, more advanced uh, techniques in chapter 12. All right, let's get started. Now, as with everything else in the compiler, we're going to break down all of the steps in code generation into a variety of functions that operate on each of our basic structures of declarations, statements, and expressions. And in order to make this work, we're going to need some supporting routines that will manipulate um, symbols. Uh, we've already have a module for that. Then we need to create a new module for dealing with scratch registers that will allocate and free them. Uh, a real simple module for creating and printing labels. And if we put everything together and keep it recursive and lazy, it will be pretty straightforward. The first thing we need to do is create a module to keep track of all of the scratch registers that we are going to use as uh, intermediate values in our expressions. And so what you're going to do here is create a, a new module called scratch that has three methods. Scratch alloc is going to look for an available register and uh, return a number representing that register after marking it as in use. When you're done with a register, you're going to call scratch free and that register number, which will release it. And uh, whenever you want to generate some code, we're going to call scratch name, which given a register number, will return uh, the actual x86 name. Now, you know that we have 16 registers available. However, only a certain number of them are going to be used for scratch values. And you can go back and look at the table in uh, chapter 10 uh, related to the calling convention to see all of the registers that we set aside only for scratch purposes. So this is RBX and then R10 through R15. Uh, since it will be inconvenient in our code generator to always use these names, we'll just use these numbers 0 through 6, and you'll have a little array internally that will keep track of whether they are in use or not. This also makes it easy to port your code generator to new architectures. So if you are going to use ARM or MIPS or what have you, which have different register names, well then you could just swap out the names in the array rather than changing all of your code generator internally. So that's scratch register management. Oh, I should say, um, it is possible that you will uh, run out of registers. So uh, for now, if scratch alloc discovers that there are no registers available, then the thing to do is just print out an error message to that effect and exit the compiler. We'll come back to this topic later and consider what happens when we run out of registers. The next thing we're going to need to do is generate a large number of labels. So as you'll recall, labels internally are the assembly language names for everything in the program, including variables and functions. But also for every single point where we want to jump somewhere, we're going to need an internal label. And these are not visible in the source language, but they are visible in the assembly. And so by convention, all of our internal labels are going to be named um, uh, dot, l, and number. So every time you need a new label, uh, your module uh, label is going to uh, uh, provide the method label create, which will generate a new integer. You're just going to incre increment a number and return it. And then whenever you want to print it out, um, you're going to call label name, which will format this nicely. All right, so every time we generate a jump, we're going to need a new label. Symbols. So you recall that a symbol structure 
represents the storage location, purpose, and type of a variable. And uh, for parameters and locals in particular, it identifies the ordinal position of that parameter or local in the function. Now, <clears throat> every time we refer to one of these variables, we need to perform an address computation, and that looks a little different depending on the nature of the symbol. But fortunately, that symbol structure has all the information that we need. So consider this bit of C minor code here. We have a global variable up here, a string, and then we have a function here that has two parameters, x and y, and it has a uh, uh, local variable z. Now every time we refer to a variable, we're going to have to generate a, a bit of code for that address computation. And here when we refer to a, we're simply going to emit literally the string a, because in assembly this is a, a global variable, and so we refer to it by the name of its label directly. But for these variables down here, x is the first parameter to the function. So when we refer to x in the assembly code, again going back to our stack diagram, we're going to refer to 8 bytes below the base pointer. That's where the first parameter of the function always is. In a similar way, when we refer to y, we refer to 16 bytes below the base pointer, and z is 24 bytes below the base pointer, because it comes after the first two parameters. So, what you're going to do is write a function called symbol codegen, which examines the symbol and returns a string that uh, performs the appropriate computation based on uh, where that variable is in the stack layout or global memory. Now, I should point out <clears throat> that uh, we're going to uh, be just uh, maybe a little bit sloppy. I don't know if sloppy is the right word. We're, we're going we're gonna to play it fast and loose with C here in order to um, make our code generation really easy. And we're going to use static strings. So the way this is going to work is symbol code gen is going to take in a struct symbol and return a string, const car star. Now, if you really wanted to, you could malloc up a new string every time you called symbol code gen. Um, but we're going to be doing that a whole lot, and your, uh, if you did that, then your memory usage uh, would explode rather quickly. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little uh, trick in C, in which you declare a static string inside of a function. Now, what is a static string? Well, it is a local variable. Uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It is a variable that has local scope, meaning this string can only be referred to by name from within this function. However, it has a static storage class, which really means that it goes in the data segment of the program, and it still exists when the function exits. So, we have a string here, it's declared static. <clears throat> Your symbol cogen can printf into it, sprintf into it, um, we're going to use snprintf to limit the size of that print so we don't overrun the variable, and then return a pointer to that string. Now ordinarily you couldn't return a pointer to a local variable, but since it's a static string, it remains in the data segment even after the function exits, and so it's still there. Now this is, as I said, this is playing a little bit fast and loose with C, and this can be dangerous. If, for example, you had one expression that used this function twice, you could get into trouble because you wouldn't end up with two strings. You'd end up with two pointers to the same string. So you just have to be careful that symbol cogen only gets used once in a given statement. Otherwise, you get into trouble. Now, if you're offended by that, um, that's okay. Um, some of you purists are going to be offended by it. If that really offends you, then instead of declaring a static string, just malloc a new string every time and return it, and then you can keep track of those things and free them when they're done. Now, by the way, I'm, I'm an engineer, and so I firmly believe in, in um, finding the simplest, most direct solution to the problem at hand. It isn't necessary to over-engineer this. Um, in a more complex compiler, we might take a more complicated approach. But this is nice and simple, and we'll solve the problem we have. All right, so now we have 
um, the supporting routines necessary to build a simple expression generator. And here's the idea. What we're going to do is start with our AST. Uh, now, if we had a more complicated compiler that had an intermediate representation, we would probably generate code from our DAG. For a project compiler, we're just going to go directly from the AST, uh, and, and we'll be able to accomplish what we want. We're going to perform a post-order traversal of the expression, and then for each expression in that node, we generate the left and right children if they exist. Once we've generated our children, we go and allocate a register for the results of the current node by using scratch alloc. Now we need to allocate a register if it doesn't already exist. If, we're, if we are generating a destructive instruction, sometimes we can just reuse the left or the right register from one of the children. We'll see examples of that. Then we emit an instruction using the registers that we've chosen. And when we're all done with that node, we free any unneeded registers so that they become available for other nodes. And again, if we happen to run out of registers, we're just going to abort for now. Now, the virtue of this approach is that each node is entirely independent of the other nodes. So every single node in our expression tree is going to result in one or more instructions on the output stream. Now, this isn't necessarily the most efficient way to do it. A really efficient compiler would um, cover multiple nodes with a single instruction, but for simplicity, we're going to have each node independent, and their only relationship is going to be the registers that are communicated along the edges between nodes. All right, so let's start off with a simple example. Here we have uh, two values being added with an iAd node in a DAG. And that value once added, we're going to subtract it from the value b. Finally, we're going to take that whole result and assign it into c. And to start off, we're going to assume that a and b and c are simply global integers, to keep things simple. All right, so to generate code for this example, we're going to do a post-order traversal. So we start with the assign node here. And we're going to go down the left side, and then the left side, and the left side, so that the first node that we completely evaluate is this A here. Now for every leaf in the tree, we are going to perform a load that is going to pull that value into a register. So we call scratch alloc to allocate a register, and uh, let's suppose that it gives us register 0 to begin with. Now remember, uh, what I'm going to use here is the integer R number, rather than giving you the x86 names. That's just to keep things clear for the moment. So we take A and load it into register 0, and we emit the instruction move QA into register 0. So we've processed this node here, come back up here, go down to the right-hand child, and we process this node over here. In a similar way, we're going to allocate register 1 for this node and generate move Q, the literal value 3, into register 1. Now we've processed this node, so we return to the parent, and we consider this I add. We allocate, uh, well, I'm sorry, we're going to reuse the register R1 because we're going to have a destructive add instruction. And on the x86, add Q adds the value R0 into the register R1 destructively, and the result stays in R1. So we're going to mark the result of this node as being in the register 1. Now for each of these register values, we're simply taking that integer and recording it into the node so that we can remember what happened. Now we're all done with register R0 here, so we're going to free it. And now we are ready to continue up here. So we completed this left-hand side of the subtree. Come back up here, down here. And now we're going to allocate a new register. Zero is available. So we move B into register zero. And we're going to um, uh, subtract zero from one and leave the result in R1. Finally, we come up to the top here and we move R1 into C. 
Now, I did this <clears throat> with each of the numeric register values, but really when we generate code, we're going to use um, a scratch name to omit the actual x86 register names. And if we do that, then our output code looks like this. Now, our code isn't always going to be that easy to read. So let's suppose that A and B and C were instead local, variable, local variables or parameters on the stack. In that case, symbol code gen would generate uh, offsets relative to the base pointer for A and B and C, and our code would look like this. So the address computation is a little more complicated, but each one of them remains a single move instruction in which we load something off the stack into a register, or we store something from a register into the stack. Now, by the way, you'll remember when we talked about x86 code, that move had some restrictions on uh, what it could access. For example, you couldn't use two memory locations in a move. One of them had to be a register. Since every reference to a variable is either going to be a load or a store, we just sort of neatly step, a, uh, step aside around that restriction and uh, your moves will always be valid. All right, so now what does our code generation code look like? Here's the basic idea. You're going to write a function called expert code gen, which is going to operate on an expert. And in my examples here, we're simply going to printf the uh, resulting assembly code out to standard output. Now, in practice, you would probably want to open a separate file and then fprintf to that file, but just in the interest of keeping my example simple, I'm just going to fprintf to standard out. So, <clears throat> to generate an expression, as always, we just test for null at the beginning to make sure we don't make a mistake. And now, since we have many different kinds of expressions, we're going to switch on the kind of expression. And for leaf nodes, our strategy is to allocate a register and then to load a value into that register. So for example, if we encounter a name, a variable name, then what we're going to do is allocate a new scratch register. This returns the integer representing that register and we store it in eRegister. Uh, this is a field that uh, you can add to expressions just for this purpose. And now we have all the information we need to generate the load for that expression node. So we're going to print out a move operation. Here's the source and the destination. The source is the symbol for which you are moving, symbol code gen, and the target is the name of the register to which we want to move. And that's it. That's the whole thing. Isn't that really simple? That was easy. So by setting up our supporting routines nicely, our code generation becomes really simple. And most of our expression nodes will just be a few lines like this. Now, obviously, we're going to have to have a large number of cases for all the different kinds of expressions we can have. That's the basic idea. Let's look at a couple more cases. Suppose that we have an interior node that has a left and a right child. So if we have an expression that performs an addition, then what we're going to do is generate code for the left and the right children keeping in mind that when we do that, they will result in values stored in registers, and that register number will be in the register field of the left and right child. Once they are in registers, we are ready to generate an add instruction. So here's an add with the source and the destination. And we know that both of them are registers, so we simply give the name of the left register and the name of the right register, and there is our complete instruction. Now, the thing that we have to be careful of is to get the register right for the result. So in this case, we know that x86 instructions are always destructive on the target. So the value of the result of the addition is going to be in the right register. And we indicate that by saying that the register for the value of this node is going to be the same as the register for the right node. Now make sure you get the causation right here. This isn't true because we said it. It's true because that's how x86 arithmetic instructions work. They're destructive on the right-hand side. And so we're just reflecting the truth of that in this code. So this register got destroyed. 
but this register is no longer in use. And so what we have to do is indicate that by freeing the left-hand side register. So for each of your arithmetic instructions, you're going to have to write a few lines like this that reflect the generation of the left and right, the emission of the instruction, and then encoding how those registers were used in that particular instruction. Now, I've done this separately here for the switch statement. I'm sure that if you're clever, you can figure out how to share some of the code so you don't have to keep repeating X per cogen, E left and right, and scratch tree and all that stuff. Here's a different example. Whenever we do an assignment, we have to be careful about the side effect and the result of the expression. So you recall that when we have an assignment, A equals B, the value of that expression is B, and the side effect is that B gets assigned to A. So we have to make sure that both happen here. Uh, and here's how we do it. Um, we generate code uh, for the left side of the assignment, which is going to give us the value. And then what we do is we move that value, which is an E left register, into the address computation for um, the variable of interest, which is on the right-hand side. So here we have a move from a register into an address computation. That's all well and good. And then you'll notice that we make the value, uh, the value register equal to the left-hand side register, and we don't free anything. And by doing this, this allows us to use an assignment operator within an expression, or to stack up multiple assignment operators. All right, so anywhere you have uh, an operator that has a side effect, you have to be careful to implement the side effect as well as returning the proper value. I'll also point out that some nodes in the expression tree can have some complicated internal structure. So we've already seen how instructions like imol and idiv can be kind of wonky because they operate on specific uh, registers that are set aside for that purpose. So when you generate a multiply um, instruction, excuse me, when you generate code for a multiply node, you'll generate the left and the right, but then that multi multiply node by itself is going to result in at least three instructions. One is moving the left, the register of the left value into RAX, multiplying by the right register, and you'll recall that imol puts its result in RAX and then the high bits in RDX. So then you're going to move the result from RAX into the register that you've allocated for the result. So there's a lot going on there in one node. And likewise, when you use idiv, you have to move, sign extend, do the division, and then retrieve the result. Now, this all works because we've set aside RAX as the accumulator. Uh, it's not being used as a scratch register. At any given moment, it's not saved between nodes. Uh, let me rephrase that. It has no uh, implied save between nodes, so we don't rely on its value um, uh, remaining. So you can use RAX for whatever you want as long as that use is within one node. Let's look at a more complicated example. So function calls... Uh, you'll recall, consists of a call node that have the name of the function on the left, and then we have the arguments in an unbalanced tree going off to the right that is effectively a linked list. So the first argument here is 10. You see that on the left over here. And then the second argument is the integer add of b and c, which are over here. And then the end of the argument list is indicated by a null. So let's walk through what the code generation looks like for that. So we're going to do uh, traversal here. We don't have to generate anything for f because we, we simply know its name and there's nothing else to know there. So uh, the first uh, node for which you actually emit an instruction is this one here, in which we move 10 into the first scratch register, which is rbx. And there's nothing more to do there, so we go down here. And now we load B into the second scratch register, R10, and C into the third scratch register, R11, and add them together. It's a destructive add, and the result is an R11. 
So you can see now here that we have our two values. Uh, uh, the literal value 10 is in RBX, and the addition is in R11. But now, to, in order to perform a function call in 64-bit x86 code, we have to take those values and move them into the appropriate argument registers. So here, this value is going to go in RSI, and this value is going to go in RDI. Now we have our values in the registers, and you'll recall before we call a function, we have to save the, call, um, the caller saved registers, which are R10 and 11. Then we call the function, and control is transferred over to uh, the function, which is going to go do its own work. It will compute a result and put that into EAX and then return. When we come back, we have to res restore um, the caller saved registers. Now our result is in EAX, and the call node here is going to take EAX and allocate a new register and move the result into that register. So in this case, let's say it's RBX. And finally, RBX gets moved into um, uh, the location of A. And so that's the code for that entire expression. Now, there are some things about this that are not as optimal as they could be. And they all stem from the fact that each node stands alone. So down here, it may seem weird to you that first we moved for the value from RAX into RBX and then RBX into A. And altogether, yes, that is weird, but when considered individually, it makes sense. The call node doesn't know where its value is going, and RAX is just a, uh, a temporary that, that can't be relied upon. So as soon as we get a value back from a function, we have to allocate a register and put it somewhere, because call doesn't know what it's going to be used for. Only when we get to the assign node does assign node that this register is going into A, and so it moves RBX into A. Likewise, you'll see that we had uh, R11 used here, but R10 was no longer in use. So it wasn't actually necessary to save R10, or for that matter, R11, because it was already in an argument node. But for safety in the general case, whenever we call a function, we are going to save and restore um, the caller saved registers um, so that we don't have to worry about the complicated cases. All right, so this is an example of how when we generate code one node at a time, there's a simple, straightforward way to do it, but sometimes you do unnecessary work. Sometimes it's a little more complicated than is strictly necessary, but it does work. All right, so now you know the strategy for generating expressions. There are a lot more nodes you have to work on, but you know the general approach. So let's move on and think about statements. Now statements are a little different because statements involve control flow and they involve sequences of operations in order. Now if you look at, if you go back and look at the AST handout, there are only a couple kind of statements and we can start off by handling the simplest ones. So one kind of statement you can have is a declaration that is a declaration within a function call. And in that case, we simply delegate that code to decl code gen and call it a day. A statement may be an expression. And in that case, we call expert code gen to generate the code for the expression. And because the expression is a tree that computes a value that goes into a register, whenever you generate code for an expression, you have a register left over at the end. And so we have to free the, the register um, containing the value uh, that that expression computed into. In fact, whenever you see an expert code gen, you eventually have to uh, free the register or otherwise use it in some way. Return is slightly more complicated. So when we have a return statement, we are computing the value of an expression, and then we expect that value to be put in the proper place as the return value of this function. So we do each of those things bit by bit. First, we generate the expression, so we have a value, and it's in a register, but not necessarily the one that we want. So we have to take this value and move it from the current register into RAX. 
Uh, by the way, note here, whenever you printf and you're dealing with this percent syntax, here this indicates a string. Here we actually want a percent in the output, so we have to put two percents there. So we're going to move from uh, the name of the register of that expression into RAX, which is the standard result register. And then we have to go through the whole code necessary to return from the function. So that means unwinding the stack, restoring the call e saved registers, restoring the stack frame, all that stuff. We're going to assume that's in a bit of code called um, a function name appended with epilogue. So we're going to jump to that epilogue and then screen that and then free that scratch register. Now you notice here that we have to have the containing function name available, so that's just something you're going to have to puzzle out about how to pass that down into the code. And because we're being recursive and lazy here, uh, we'll come back and talk about that epilogue later. Let's just assume it exists for now. Now, conditional statements are where it starts to get more interesting. For any kind of flow control structure, I find it useful to write out a set of patterns that represents what's going on in the flow control structure. So if we look at conditionals in the general case, you can think about it from a syntactic point of view as saying an if statement has a Boolean expression that controls what to do. And if that Boolean expression evaluates to true, we execute the true statements. Otherwise, we execute the false statements. Now, the thing to do is to uh, take those parameterized parts and move them over into a bit of an assembly template that represents the same things. It's just we're going to put the boxed parts exactly as they were because we're going to generate code for those and then only write out the code for the control flow parts surrounding them. So here's the equivalent assembly template for a conditional statement. First, we generate the code for the control expression. And that results in a value in a register, a Boolean value. Now we have a couple of instructions that are specific to the if statement. We're going to issue a compare against that uh, Boolean register. We're going to compare it against the value 0. If the value is equal to 0, the statement is false, and so we need to jump to a false label down at the bottom. Otherwise, we're going to continue past that jump statement and execute the true statements. So we generate code for that. And once we're done with that, then we have to jump over the false part down to the done label. Now, in this case, false label and done label are not uh, fixed values, but of course we have to generate unique labels for those two things for each of those statements. Okay, so that's not hard to work out. And once we've written out that bit of an assembly template, then we can take that template and start turning it into code generator code. And here's what that would look like. For a statement, that's an if-else statement, first thing we do are generate two unique labels, uh, the else label and the done label. Now we generate code in order. First we generate code for the uh, control Boolean expression and then we compare that register to the value 0. Here the register is given by scratch name of s expert register. And once we've done that, we are completely done with that Boolean expression, and so we can free that register. Next, we compare, uh, I'm sorry, we already compared, and we're going to jump, if the value is equal to 0, to the else label. If it's not equal to zero, we fall through and generate the code for the body here. And at the end of the body, we jump over the false part down to the done label. Otherwise, we generate the else label and generate the else body. There's not much else to say about that. It's pretty straightforward. So now for each kind of statement that has some sort of control flow, you need to go back and write out a little template like this, and then go forward and write uh, code corresponding to the template. <coughs> now, the only thing you have to be careful of throughout is 
to free expressions when you're done with them. And then also to make sure that you've handled the full generality of the statement. So for example, an if statement could be a plain if. It could also be an if with an else. So you'll have to generalize this a bit to make sure that it works if your if statement doesn't have an else. Loops work in very much the same way. If we have a for loop, we can write out a, a C minor template like this. A for loop consists of an initializing expression, a control expression, and a next expression. And then within the for loop is a body of statements. Now, people are often confused about this because these things look like statements because they end with semicolons. And, and that's true, it is confusing, because almost everywhere else in C-like languages, a semicolon indicates the completion of a statement. But really, in these cases, these are just three expressions. And really, they can be any expressions. They don't necessarily have to have side effects. It's just a custom that the initializing expression assigns a value to a variable. And it's a custom that the next expression modifies that variable by, for example, incrementing it. The only real requirement is that this expression, if it exists, must be Boolean because it's going to control whether the loop continues. Now, any of these expressions can be left out. If the init expression is left out, we just don't do it. If this expression is left out, it's assumed to be true. If this expression is left out, we don't do it. All right, so now we convert this to a little assembly template in a similar way. The equivalent assembly for a for loop is to first execute the init expression once. That sets up whatever control variable we have. Then we have a label that represents the top of the loop. The first thing we do every time we go through a loop is to evaluate the expression. And now, if the register representing an expression is false, we jump to the done label at the bottom of the loop. Otherwise, we execute the body of the statements and then we execute the next expression, which is going to increment, and then we have to jump back to the top. And I see now, I left out a jump instruction. Hmm, my mistake, I'm going to have to fix that. The last thing that should happen here before the done label is to jump back up to the top label in order to keep going. Now, I find this kind of funny, because, you know, we, we think of generating code, writing a compiler is sort of a, you know, an, an advanced topic once you know a lot about programming. But in a funny way, this is kind of going all the way back to fundamentals of computing. Because uh, if you didn't know what a for loop was about, you know, and somebody had to describe it to you, if you open up the textbook for CS101, any kind of class, and say, well, what happens is first there's an initializing expression that gets executed once. And then you evaluate the expression at the top, and if it's false, then you, then you do the body statements, do the next... And so, so explaining to the computer how a for loop works is almost identical to how we explain it to CS101 students. I think that's kind of funny. Um, because is it, is it profound? No, it's not profound. It's actually kind of straightforward. But the fact that it's straightforward is actually kind of reassuring that the way we explain it to a computer is exactly the same way we explain it to beginning programming students. So that's kind of cool. Now, um, so for all the kind of statements that involve some kind of control flow, you're going to follow the same process. Write out a template in the source language, write out a template in the assembly language, and then you are ready uh, to go and write code that corresponds to the template, and it should be pretty straightforward. So that's most of statements. I'll let you figure out the rest of statements, but there's one thing I want to come back to, which is conditional expressions. And these are kind of funny because conditional expressions look more like statements than they do look like expressions. So if I have any sort of expression, which is a comparison, so here I have uh, something on the left and something on the right. In the middle, I could have a less than, a greater than, equal to, not equal to, what have you. That's a conditional expression. Now, it would be really handy if uh, the x86 architecture gave us an instruction to represent a comparison like that. But unfortunately, it doesn't give us an instruction that works in the same way as an add or subtract or a multiply. The only thing that it gives us is um, comparison and jump. And so what we have to do here 
is whenever we see one of these uh, tiny little characters, we have to generate a fair amount of code in order to generate a Boolean value in the target register. So here's how this works. We generate the left expression, put the result in the register. We generate the right expression, put the result in the register. And now we have to compare them with each other. In this case, it's less than, so we have to do a jump less than. If it's, if, uh, if it's less than, we jump to the true label, and in the true label, we put the, the value true into our result register. If not, we fall through and put false into the result register and jump down to the done label. So at the end of this, we've allocated a register, and that register will contain either true or false, depending on what we did here. So a conditional expression, even though it's an expression, we generate code that looks more like a statement in that it has control flow. It's just that the goal of the control flow is to get either true or false into the target register. So that's just an oddity of conditional expressions. Um, and if you follow the same sort of approach, then you could generate a ternary expression. You remember the question mark and colon that's found in many C-like languages. Now, here's a little oddity that can come up when you put all this stuff together. So suppose you have an if statement. Well, what's, what's the most common thing to put in an if statement? Well, our, our code here assumes that our expression is a Boolean expression that's going to result in either true or false in the register, and then we compare what's in that register. But most of the time, what we put into that expression is itself a conditional expression. Right, so something left less than something right, or greater than, or equal to, or not equal to. Well, as you've probably figured out by now, when we go through that whole rigmarole, this expression here is going to expand to this whole business here. And so the funny part, it's not wrong, but the funny part is that we're going to end up doing two comparisons and jumps in order to implement an if expression. I'm sorry, an if statement. The first comparison and jump comes from performing the comparison Boolean operator. So it does a comparison and a jump in order to get uh, a, a Boolean value into a register. And then that Boolean value is substituted up here and we compare it again and then do our jump to the true statements or the false statements. So that's odd. It's a little inefficient. It does work. We could probably do better if our compiler could see a little farther and observe that inside the statement was this expression, and it's pretty common to have a comparison in this expression. And if we're really careful, we could modify this to do evaluate the left expression, evaluate the right expression, and then just do the right kind of comparison here instead of a jump equal to. Now, this is not something you have to fix. If you do the obvious thing, it'll work. It'll just end up in some excessive code. It's just some food for thought about how a more powerful technique would result in more efficient code. All right, we did expressions, we did statements, we're ready for declarations. So we have a couple of kinds of declarations to look at. The first kind are variable declarations, or, or data declarations in general. And this isn't hard to work out. All we have to do is look for each type of variable we declare and each kind of value. We need to emit in the data section the name, or I should say a label corresponding to the name of the variable, a, uh, an assembly data directive corresponding to the type of the data. So in this case, all of our integers are going to be quad words. So whenever you see an integer, you're going to declare dot quad. And then the literal value corresponding to the literal value in that declaration. So an integer becomes a quad. String becomes a dot string. That's easy. An array of four Booleans becomes quad and then four values, each corresponding to true and false. Now, you'll see here that because this is the data section and can only have literal values here, there's no, you can't have expressions. This is part of the reason why you can't have expressions here. Things in the data segment can only be data. They cannot be code. 
because it's not clear when any code in a global variable would actually be executed. So hopefully you did a good job in your type checker and you rejected any executable code in your global variables so that your life will be easy by the time you get to global variable declarations. Function declarations. Function declarations aren't hard, but you do need to go back to the previous chapter on x86 code generation and look at the basic outline structure of a function. So now whenever you encounter a function declaration in your code, we're going to omit a text directive, to say this is, goes in the text section, declare a label for the function and indicate that it is global, and then generate the preamble for the function. And as you recall, the preamble for the function sets up the stack frame by pushing the old base pointer and uh, moving the base pointer to the stack pointer. I'm sorry, moving the stack pointer to the base pointer. Uh, we are going to store the parameters of the function by um, pushing the parameter registers onto the stack. We allocate local variables by subtracting appropriate amount of space from the stack pointer. And then we have to save the call these saved registers by pushing them on the stack. And once we've done all that work, now we are ready to execute the function. And so you can generate code for the statements in the function. At the end of that statement list, you're going to omit another symbol, which is the epilogue for that function. And the epilogue for the function is going to have all the code that we discussed before at the end of the epilogue that basically reverses everything in the preamble. Restore the callee saved registers, deallocate local variables, and restore the fit stack frame, and then finally return from the function. Now the reason we put a symbol here well, there's twofold. One is any one of these statements could be a return statement, and that return statement is going to re result in a jump to the function epilogue. All right, so that allows us to have the code for the epilogue in one place, and every return is going to jump there. The second is just for safety, in that if we happen to run out of statements here, we run off the end of the statement list, then we'll run directly into the function epilogue and return. So that's how we implement just getting to the last brace and falling off the end of the function. Now, if you uh, once you get to the point of writing a global function declaration, you are almost done with your code generator. So you should be pretty excited about that. We're almost done, ready to be usable. The last thing I want to point out is local variable declarations. Turns out that there's, there's actually not much to do here. Because whenever I declare a local variable, so here I have x is an integer, its value is a plus b, and if that's inside a function, there isn't much I need to do for the declaration because the space for that variable was already allocated in the function preamble. Remember that the function um, in, in um, name resolution, we count, we're counting up the um, number of elements in the function, so we know how much stack space it needs. We already made space for that, and the symbol structure already tells you what's the location on the stack for that integer. So there's nothing to do by the time we get to that declaration, except if that variable declaration has a value to be computed, then we need to generate the code for that value. Again, this is the difference between local and global variables. They look the same in the source code, but they have a very different implementation. The local variable is stored on the stack, and whenever we encounter its declaration, we simply do an extra code gen on the right-hand side and store its value into the appropriate place on the stack. So local variables are easy. All right. You're ready to go out and start writing your code generator. Now, I know you're super excited to do this because you just got done with your type checker today, but really, this is something that you want to chip away at slowly. Um, you can't get it done. You certainly can't get it done in the last night before it's due, or even the last two or three nights. It's going to take a couple of weeks to really get it right. So really, I encourage you to get started on it right away. And here's the way to proceed. Start off by writing those supporting routines. They're simple. They're easy. Just lay them out, and it, uh, it makes the rest of the code generator go nicely. Do expressions and statements and then finally declarations in that order. Now, unfortunately, you can't test much till you get all the pieces together, but uh, just go, um, um, go deliberately, compile and check as you go. And then what you need to do is write a little driver script 
that will, for a given source program, run C minor, then assemble the output, link it, and then run the program. Then if you do that, you can just have a little script that allows you to take a source file and see if it works. Now, short story, it's not going to work the first time. So don't be dismayed, that's okay. What you need to do is start off with really simple test programs. So the first test program you write for C minor should do nothing but return a constant value, 10. Then you can run that program um, and then use the shell to print out the return value of the program. That's dollar sign question mark. So you run your program, echo dollar sign question mark, and if you get back 10, you can celebrate because then you've written your first program that compiled and ran and returned the value 10. And if that works, you can go to the next step. Return 10 plus 10. And declare a global variable and add that in. Add in some more complicated expressions. Add in a function call. Add in control statements. Test each piece of your program step by step by step. Now, you know that I require you to turn in test cases, but don't think of the test cases as a means to satisfy me. The test cases are there to encourage you to write a whole bunch of them. And if you really want to succeed at this, you write a test case for every tiny little feature of the program. You run your program through every single test case one by one by one, and it's going to help you to get organized to see what works and what doesn't and help you to debug. It's a great engineering technique, and I want you to learn it because it's useful, not learn it to make me happy. All right, and then when you're ready for a challenge, you can go to the course GitHub page, and we have some sample programs there ranging from very simple to very complicated. There's even one that uses the, uh, the simple graphics library from Fundamentals of Computing uh, uh, to do a little drawing. Now, some food for thought as you're writing your code generator. I've shown you the simplest approach in which each node stands independently. The only relationship between each node is the register pass from one to another, and each node could generate multiple instructions to carry out its work. And that's fine. But... There are a bunch of different inefficiencies here. So you'll see in your output, you'll often see multiple unnecessary register moves. That is to say, one instruction moves a value from one register to another, and then the next node moves it from yet another register back into memory. Things are going around in circles because each node doesn't know about the other nodes. Um, the x86 has all sorts of complicated instructions that do powerful things. Using this approach, you can't really exploit those powerful instructions precisely because each node does one thing. What we really want to be able to do is emit instructions that implement the work of multiple nodes. For that, we're going to need a more powerful technique um, known as dynamic tree rewriting. And finally, you'll see things uh, that local variables are not necessarily used efficiently, because every time we read from a local variable, we pull it off the stack, and every time we write to a local variable, we put it back on the stack. And uh, we may not even need to store if that value isn't used again. You may even see cases where local variables, are uh, their uses are disjoint, and so we end up using a lot of space on the stack when really we only needed to use a few values. So there are a lot of places that this could be improved. So more complex approaches are needed, so stay tuned for the next chapter in optimization, and uh, we will talk about how to make that better. All right, that's the end of Chapter 11. You are ready to go write some code. Get cracking on your code generator. Uh, good luck. I will see everybody on Friday. Thank you very much.